Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boston Spa Central School District Board of Education for March 20th. Can everyone please rise, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome everyone who is here in person, welcome all of those who are watching on the live stream from home. In the event that we would have to evacuate this uh, library here, there are two exits behind me in the corners that lead outside, and there is the exit into the hallway, the main entrance of the library. And again, welcome everyone, and uh, we're just gonna get right into it. We have recognition tonight. Thank you, everyone. We have quite a bit of recognition tonight. Uh, first up, we have uh, Mr. Dave Lotto, Grant's chairperson from the Boston Spa Education Foundation. Please come on up. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> sorry about my voice. My daughter decided to give me whatever virus she has, so. Um, my name is Dave Lotto, and I am the co-chair of the Boston Spa Education Foundation Grant Committee, and a teacher myself. Um, since the, with the latest round of grants, the Boston Spa Education Foundation has since its inception in 1996, funded over $445,000 in enrichment grants to educators throughout the Boston Spa School District. And it is genuinely my pleasure to recognize a group of truly dedicated educators and administrators who the foundation is proud to have awarded a total of $9,388 for educational enrichment projects within the district during the 2024 grant cycle. I want to thank the Board of Education as well as Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Duca, for the opportunity to be here tonight and with other members of the foundation to recognize them. Uh, we awarded $200 for the Gateway Grind coffee cart to speech and language pathologist Erica Hover for supplies and materials at Boston Spa Middle School. We awarded, oh, she's coming, oh, perfect. Uh, we awarded $1,600 to fund the purchase of four Spike Lego robotics kits for Mr. Eric Bursch's Earth Science and Astronomy classes at Boston Spa High School. We awarded $600 to second grade teacher Stacy Waltz to help fund reading instruction in the second grade at Gordon Creek Elementary School. Uh, we awarded $1,284 to reading teacher Gina Ralston and fifth grade teacher Carol DiGennaro to fund digital cameras for the Gordon Creek Elementary School Yearbook Club and miscellaneous classroom activities. Uh, we're excited to announce that we have made a donation of $2,100 to help offset college credit fees for students enrolled within the District Spa Academy, thanks to the hard work of our newest board member, High School Assistant Principal Scott Seligman. And our final grant was for a total of $3,604 given to Boston Spa High School physics teacher, 
James Poirier for the purchasing of optics, le optics lab equipment to allow for the continuation of quality hands-on learning for students in physics courses as the new New York State science learning standards are implemented. <clears throat> and that final grant was given in the generous uh, Fred Reiner's Memorial Grant Fund. Of course, the funding for these projects is only possible through the generous and continued donations of our faithful community. Thank you. I just want to say again, it's always my pleasure every year, twice a year, to talk about the Education Foundation and the incredible amounts of support that they provide our uh, school community. Thank you so much again to the Education Foundation. Uh, next up for recognition, we have the Boston Spa Elks Lodge 2619. Boston Spa Elks Lodge 2619 has once again donated $6,000 to support the Scotty's Backpack Program. Their very generous annual donations have, made an have been integral to this program and the supplies, the weekend meals to students and families who may otherwise go without. Like many things, the cost of food for the backpacks has increased dramatically over the past two years, and regular sponsors like the Elks ensure the program can continue to benefit approximately 200 elementary students in our district. We thank the Elks for being a valued community partner, and tonight we have leading night Carol Turney, who will be tonight's recipient of recognition. I really wasn't prepared to say our talk, but um, my daughter Kim's in charge of this program and uh, she couldn't be here tonight because she doesn't feel well. But our Elks Club, Elks Lodge, c continues to support the community and we love to do this every year to make sure the kids have their food for the weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Mr. Lopez and the Boston Spa Troupe, cast of Beauty and the Beast, to talk to us about this weekend's performance. So in front of you, we have a little bit more than our cast. Uh, we have over 80 students that are part of our production. Um, and they're part of our pit, our crew, and our cast. Um, as the director, I cannot do this alone. I want to just send out a special thanks uh, to Mrs. Chamberlain is our music director. Mr. R is our orchestra director. Mr. Gatz is our producer. Uh, Mr. Bailey and Mrs. Livingston are our tech directors. And Mrs. Kinney is our choreographer. Uh, they work endless hours to put on an amazing production. About 40 minutes ago, we finished up our final rehearsal, uh, and it was just absolutely amazing. 
Uh, we hope to see you. Um, and I have Roman Mangino here, who, if you know Roman, he does like to talk. And so, <laughs> Roman, it's all yours. I would just like to start off by saying thank you to the board for having us here and so that we can present ourselves. So I would like to start off by introducing some of our principal cast members in order to get an understanding of who you're going to be seeing up on the stage and who's going to be in the front, though everybody is incredibly talented. So if you guys could please raise your hand when I call out your name, that would be great. We have Katie Bonanto playing Belle. We have Peter Hinckley playing the Beast. Andrew, Bro Andrew Brooks as Cogsworth. Fiona Hughes as Miss Potts. Keith Dubois as LeFou. What's up? And Ben Ferrara as Lumiere. Take it away, Ben. Um, and if you guys would like to come and show us a little bit of support, our opening night is tomorrow, and we have four other shows. So it's Saturday and Friday at 7, Saturday at 1, and Sunday at 1. So if you guys can come, we would love to have you. Thank you. Thank you all. Our kids are pretty tired. Uh, they worked the past three nights, so we'd like to show you a little preview. Thank you. So thank you. We hope you support the arts here at Balsam Spa. The kids have worked tremendously hard. Thank you very much. And finally, for recognition, I'd like to introduce our athletic director, Mr. Dave Sunkis, and we'll be doing some winter sports recognition. Good evening, everyone. Board, thank you for allowing us to come here and present our student athletes and teams that have had great success this winter. As always, we, uh, we like to start out with the, um, the first part of student athlete, and that's student. So we had nine winter athletic teams qualify as New York State Scholar Athlete teams. We had 114 students with a combined GPA of 93.009. Our girls indoor track team had a GPA of 94.691. Our boys indoor track team had a GPA of 94.651. Our girls basketball team had a GPA of 93.847. Our boys basketball team had a GPA of 93.700. Our girls bowling team had a GPA of 92.730. Our boys bowling team had a GPA 
of 91.819. Our boys swim and dive team had a GPA of 93.954. Our ice hockey team had a GPA of 90.890. And our boys alpine ski team had a GPA of 90.796. So, It goes without saying that we do put um, the student athlete, we put the student before the athlete here, um, which is something we pride ourselves on. Three years in a row, we've been to School of Excellence in New York State and hope to be again this year. We had three teams this year that had great success. And the first team I'm gonna call up is our unified bowling team, Coach Rob Emmel. Hi, thanks for being here. Thank you to Dr. Duca and the board for this recognition. Uh, I am Rob Immel, the unified bowling coach. We did have a successful year. Um, success is definitely measured by different things. Uh, with unified bowling, one of my favorite aspects of it is it's the small celebrations, whether you get a strike, whether you win, get a spare, maybe even hit a pin, uh, eat as many fries as you can, whatever it is. Uh, we celebrate all the successes, but we did a very nice job. Um, this is our largest unified team we have uh, in Boston Spot history, which was awesome. It was a little challenging, but with the lane availabilities and so many schools having unified bowling teams, uh, organization was tough, but everybody kind of hung together. And even if they weren't bowling, they were cheering on other teams or cheering on their teammates. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, at championships, we, we stepped up. It was pretty wild and awesome to see. We had a lot of bowlers get personal bests. We had a bowler that never bowled 100. She bowled 103, 106, 109 in her three games. And uh, we ended up winning our division and winning the section, which is pretty awesome, pretty incredible. Uh, there is a video here that kind of explains what we do. It's more fun to watch than me talking. I, I think it's queued up next. I am Coach Immel. I am the head coach of the Unified Bowling Team here at Boston Spa. My name is Natalie. My name is Xavier. And I'm Bill Waters. I'm Alex Barnes. And I'm a Boston Spa Unified Bowler. Uh, my ultimate goal with Unified Bowling is to provide an opportunity for students uh, of all skills and ability levels uh, with a fun time, a good time, teach them how to bowl, uh, have them meet new people, and overall just have a great experience uh, with bowling and with other students here at Boston Spa. I've been on the team for like three years. I noticed that there have been very good people on the team and awesome coaches. I did it last year, it was quite fun. You get to chat with friends, hang out with friends, and also bowl at the same time. It's my favorite season to coach. Unified bowling is all about smiles and high fives and just providing a fun experience. I was nervous at first, but as soon as you get out there, I don't know, just a fun time. It's pretty great. Uh, a lot of fun times, a lot of good memories being made here. A lot of good people. Join Unified because it's fun. You meet new people, um, different cliques and different groups of, of friends get together and get to know new people and, and their qualities, how they are, uh, great personal skills, and uh, like I said, overall, just a fun time. If they like bowling and they like chatting with friends and after school, I'd recommend them to do that. And it's also a good way to just make new friends. If you're looking for something to do that's fun, something that's good, you know, get you out of the house a little bit, I think it's a, it's a good thing to do. It's a good way to make friends and enjoy some good experiences while playing out there. Yeah, so that's what unified bowling is. It, it, oh. So what, what, I, what I noticed about all my unified seasons is strangers kind of come together for the couple months that it is, and 
now they're sitting together in the cafeteria, they're sitting together in study halls, they're high-fiving each other in the hallway, so it does unify the school building, and it's also cool to meet other teams in, from different schools. Uh, like I said, we had a large team this year. I'm going to announce everybody, even if they're not here. I know other sports and activities are going on right now, but just to give them some recognition. Um, when you hear your name, come on up, get your certificate, and we can line up for a picture. Alex Barnes. <laughs> Colin Casey. <laughs> Matt Cook. <laughs> PJ Cronin. <laughs> Kate Fletcher. <laughs> Kyle Gravelding. <laughs> Bella Caldi. Christian Caldy, Kerry Kurgle, Braden Kershaw, Mia Lagoy, Kaylee Loveless, There's Kaylee, Lauren Lynch, Haley Masters, Nate McVeigh, Katie Miller. Liliana Moya Martinez, Mike Penfold, Sorry, bud. Maddie Peroni, Maddie. Brad Pingelski, Jacob Powell, Andrew Sokolish, Abby Ryan, Libby Ryan, Jesse Schaller. Natalie Simak, Nora Tallman, Xavier Tokos, Gary Totten, Ella Twist, Mark Vadness, James Vokes, Dylan Waters, Bree Williams, Juliana Wiltsey, and Ryan Voitkovich. I'd like to also thank my assistant coaches, Mike Fisher and Amy Wirt, for all their help. Great job, guys. Let's hold this up proud. I hold that, Christian. All right, your champion unified bowling team. Thank you. Parents, if you want to move up to get a better picture, you can. Come on up. Thanks, Colin. Raise it up tall, Christian. There you go. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> Did you say, can I take that home with me? Go ahead. We'll get another one. Don't worry about it. Again, Coach Immel, thank you for all your hard work with this. Um, <clears throat> when I tell you that there's, there's no better person, there's no better personality, um, someone that comes with energy, uh, sometimes too much energy every day, uh, Coach Immel really does a great job with these kids. The inclusion is outstanding. And uh, Boston Spa was one of the first six schools that started unified bowling. Um, 14 years ago now, and now you see 
where we are and how many kids are involved. And when we first started, we had real trouble of finding what we call partners. Um, and now we have too many. We'll have to make cuts next year, maybe. We'll see. Uh, but again, thank you, Coach Immel. Um, congratulations on your success. The next. The next group um, is our girls indoor track team. Um, I would sit here and start naming off all the new school records, but we would be here way too late. So I'm going to ask uh, Coach Priest and Coach German to come up and highlight uh, their season. All right, we're just going to call the team up here first. Uh, so we're going to start with Gabby Bozeth. Harriet Healy. Petrina Z. Tatiana McRae. Um, so I, I promise that I will make this as quick as possible, but when you start to hear what this team has accomplished, you'll start to see why I had to go on to slightly onto the back of a page. Um, I have coached 20 years. This actually was my 36th season of coaching, and I can honestly say it's, it's not a lie. I've said it to the girls and boys because they're going to hear about them next. Um, this is by far the most successful team or season I've ever had in those 36 seasons. Um, so we had to go back. And I'm not exaggerating, as a math teacher, I literally lost count of the records broken. If you talk about just the actual records broken, uh, we broke 13 of them this season. If you talk about the fact that they broke their own record literally every time they stepped on a new track, it was 29 school records this season. So um, I won't bore you with the details, but basically if you can imagine every sprinting event we have possible and a couple distance races, is, they broke them. Uh, I want to talk about the Section 2 leaderboard. For those of you that aren't familiar with our area, we are widely known across the state and actually nationally known as the top-ranked section, not only in the state, but in the entire country. So when I say they... <laughs> when I say they're running against the best, I literally mean they're running against the best. So in our Section 2 leaderboard, this is anyone that competes for Section 2, we had the top two girl athletes in the 55 meter and 60 meter dash. We went number one, three, four, and nine in the 200. We went number two and three in the 300. We went second in the 400 and the 500. We went fifth in the 600. We went fifth in the 800. We were fourth in the 200 hurdles. We were second in the SMR, the first time they ever ran together as a team. And they were first, the fastest team in section two for the four by two. Then we had some individual really, really big highlights. We went to the Springfield Envy, and Harriet Healy not only set a uh, personal best for the season, she actually broke the meet record at the complex in the 300-meter dash. Nice. Our girls sprint medley relay that you see right here, they also run the 4x2. They are now the fourth fastest in Section 2 history all time. And then Petrina and Gabby are the fourth and fifth fastest, respectively, and the 60 meter all time in section two. You can see the, the pattern here. This same group of four girls are now the second fastest four by two girls team to ever compete in section two, and that is by 0.35 seconds. I'm only going to talk about the state meet and beyond because the regular season was also very successful, but we would be here a really long time. So just talking about the state meet and beyond, we had five athletes attend. Um, for the girls' side, we had Harriet, who came in seventh in all of New York State in the 300. <laughs> Gabby placed fifth in New York State for the 300. 
And Petrina ran a great PR and came in fourth place in New York State for the 55 meter dash. <laughs> then including the boys team, we had seven of those athletes also qualify to run New Balance Nationals in Boston. Um, and just to give you an idea, they qualified for 10 events at Nationals. We had Kim who was not here today, but one of our eighth graders qualified and competed in the 60 meter dash. And then we had Tatiana qualified for both the four by two and SMR. <laughs> Petrina qualified for the 60 meter dash, also the four by two relay and the SMR. Gabby qualified and ran, which is a very hard thing to do in all four of her events. She ran the 60 meter, the 200 meter, the four by 200 meter, and the 400 leg of the sprint medley relay. <laughs> Harriet also qualified for four events. She also ran the 200 meter, I'm sorry, she ran the 400 meter, the four by two, qualified in the 200, and ran the 800 leg of our sprint medley, medley relay. And then came the big highlight. This girls team, unfortunately, uh, we had one person who was sick when we ran the relay the first time in Springfield. And just to give you an idea of how elite these girls are, uh, the first time we ran it, we broke the school record, which was awesome. And then the first time this group ran it together, they broke that school record by 13 seconds. They also came in 17th in the country at nationals. And if that wasn't enough, we were also one of the best, in our opinion, the best four by two in the country. Um, they are not only great kids, but they are not only great athletes, but they're great kids. They're fun to work with, they're fun to coach. This girls team you see in front of you came in 11th place in the nation for the four by 200 meter dash relay. So congratulations, girls. You're welcome. Parents, you wanna sag some pictures or wait till we have everybody? It's up to you guys. Take pictures. Pictures, all right, pictures. Coach says take pictures. Um, I'd like to call up our two boys that are also being recognized. We have Devin Hemraj and Kalai Makanani. All right, so much like the girls, uh, we had an amazing season with the boys. Um, again, competing against the best, best athletes and runners you're gonna see pretty much anywhere in the state and beyond, as we proved when we went to nationals. Um, so again, they were included in those records that we broke. Um, again, pretty much every sprint that they have, we had someone break it multiple times. Um, I actually walked in and Stuart Williams said to me, yeah, I tried to keep up on your records, but by the time I posted it, you already ran somewhere else and broke the next record. So I kind of gave up. Yeah. You wanna do this? No. Okay. <laughs> Great team right here. <laughs> um, on the section two leaderboard, again, we're against the best in the entire state. Uh, we were third and fourth in the 200 meter dash. We are second in the 300 meter dash second in the 55 hurdles, and second in the 60 meter hurdles. Um, and it's just amazing to watch these guys come to practice every day, work really hard, and then go to these really big meets and achieve these personal bests. And just the quality that we see is astounding. Um, as, for, as far as our highlights, um, we had, again, five athletes attend the New York State Championship meet. Devin and Kalai uh, were part of that group. Devin was 16th in the 55 meter hurdles in New York State, and he has only been hurdling for two seasons. Um, he did indoor and outdoor, um, and then basically I started with him, no, I'm sorry, outdoor and indoor, so really that was a huge deal for someone with that little time. Um, so we have big plans for this outdoor season. 
Uh, Kalai was also at the New York State meet, and he came in fifth for the 300-meter dash in all of New York State. It was 16th Federation. It was 13th for public schools, because Federation includes public and private. They know their stats. <laughs> That's right. Um, these two also qualified for nationals. Um, and then they got to go and literally run against the best in the country. Um, it was amazing to see them. They got to go to the Reggie Lewis Center down in Boston and see them run against the best of the best. Uh, Kalai qualified in the 200 meter and competed, and Devin was in the 60 meter hurdles. Both had really good days. Um, I think they have a lot more to come because you're looking at two juniors, so we're not losing either of them to graduation, which is huge when you hear the list of accomplishments that they have. Um, Kalai also literally sent me a message and said, Hey, coach, I'm going to be going to Virginia, and coincidentally, Adidas Nationals are there. So once again, he ran an extra meet at Adidas Nationals, because why not qualify for two national meets? Um, he broke his own school record by over a quarter of a second, which when you're only talking about 22 seconds is a really big deal. So congratulations to both of these young men. Yep, we're gonna do some pictures. Um, I didn't start with that, I should've. I just wanna thank the board. I wanna thank Superintendent Dr. Duca, uh, Dave Sunkis for the opportunity to coach here. And I really wanna thank Coach Priest. Um, he does a lot of work behind the scenes. The reason that these athletes got to go to these big meets was a lot of legwork that he puts in. Um, we took them to multiple meets in New York City, Staten Island, um, and then eventually all the way to Boston for New Balance Nationals. And that wouldn't be possible without him putting in a lot of work to get them in those meets. Um, so I just want to thank those people as well. Uh, as you can see, that is um, quite the accomplishment. Uh, Coach German loves his stats, in case anybody was wondering, in case anybody fell asleep. That did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a saying that goes in athletics, you never want to follow the GOAT, the greatest of all time. You never want to follow the guy that's you know, Nick Saban. You don't want to be the coach after Nick Saban. Our wrestling program here for, I've been here for 23 years, has always been a top three, four program in the section in the state. And we had a coach here that um, was the GOAT. And uh, Coach Dalters created a program and a culture uh, in that room that resonates beyond him being here as a coach. So Coach Warren came in, a uh, new teacher, new coach, took on the challenge and just decided to win a sectional championship just because he thought it'd be fun. So I'd like to call Coach Warren um, and the, uh, his assistant coach and uh, present the varsity wrestling team. Thank you to the board for allowing us to be here tonight. It's a uh, Great honor, like Coach, or, uh, Mr. Sankas just said, in my first year, it's a pretty good one. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Sankas talked to me today and he said, you know, it's like a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to do this. And I said, no, I'm going to make a habit of it and we're going we're gonna to keep coming back for this. So expect me here next year, hopefully. All right. Um, first off, like everyone else, I'm going to bring everybody up here. We don't have everyone here, but I'll still announce their names um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So we have freshman James Capasso. Junior Cole Donnelly. Junior Max Kinsey. Junior Ben Livingston. Senior Jacob Perkins. Freshman Quentin Warlikowski. And then who we don't have in attendance right now is Junior Mia Collins. Freshman. Liam Collins, Junior Mason and Sonia, C 
senior, Ralph Keeney. <laughs> junior, Billy O'Connor. <laughs> Sophomore, Angus Page. <laughs> Sophomore, Sean Posley. <laughs> Sophomore, J uh, Tyler Perkins. <laughs> and Sophomore, Jacob Thomas. So as you can probably tell by that, we have a very, very young group. Um, we, had, we had two seniors this year that were able to compete. One senior got injured early, um, and that kind of started off our season as it went. We had a, a lot of injuries to, to begin, a lot of sickness, and then there was a new thing that a lot of you don't really understand wrestling, I don't, I don't know, but there's a new weight loss plan that came into effect this year, and it was new for everyone, but that really messed with us for the beginning. Um, you know, so for our first, I think, 10 duels, we forfeited three weight classes. Um, and out of, we have 13 weights, um, that's a lot. That's 18 points we give up right there. So a lot of our dual meets, we struggled with those. But I kept believing once we had a healthy team, we were going to be the team to beat. Um, and then we get into the postseason finally. We actually have our full strength lineup. And at the Class A tournament, we placed uh, 11, 11 wrestlers and qualified 11 to the Section 2 tournament, the state qualifiers. And then at that tournament, we had two champions, two third, one fourth. We had, oh, I'm going off the top of my head right now, uh, two fifth, two fifth, and, and one sixth. Um, and, and one second, I forgot about Cole. Sorry, Cole. Um, but out of our those top guys, only two of them were seniors. Um, so thankfully we got seniors to end on a good note. Um, but we had two of our third place guys were, were freshmen. Um, our sectional, one of our sectional champs was a, was a junior who started out as a sixth seed and then ended up in going on a tear and, and winning the whole tournament and qualifying for states. Um, junior Cole Donnelly, who took second in the section, he had went last year as a, with a seven and fourteen record, and he ended with a twenty one and eleven record in a section two finalist and qualified for state. So that's pretty impressive. Um, we have a, a really good core group of guys that I'm really excited for. And like I said earlier, I expect to be back here next year, and hopefully we have an extra <coughs> section two champion added onto our list. So our section two champion wrestling team here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know that that is a kind of a lengthy report, but if you look through through my lens, that's that's a good thing. So, um, you know, and we can't do this without the dedication that our coaches have. Uh, Coach Warren mentioned he called me today, and he had a death um, in the family, and uh, you know I said to him my, my exact words: as a friend, I want you to I want to tell you go do what you got to do, but as your boss, you may not get this opportunity every year. So um, he said he'll make it work, and that just shows the dedication. And we can't do what we do without the support of the board, um, Dr. Duca, um, our fields, our facilities, um, the ability for us to take trips that a lot of schools can't take that we challenge our kids with. Um, that is really what has started to set us apart from, from other schools. Uh, years ago, we would struggle in the Suburban Council and that's not the case anymore. Um, we compete at the highest level in the majority of our sports, and that's a, a, a true um, devotion to our coaches, our, our athletes, and all of you sitting here. So thank you. Is that it for recognition? That concludes recognition. OK. And thank you again, uh, Mr. Sunkiss. It's a tribute to your work as leading our athletic teams here. So thank you. 
All right, uh, next on our agenda is public comment. Do we have anyone signed up for public comment? Thank you. As I always do, I'm gonna read our guidance on public comment. The Board of Education welcomes district residents, parents, and other interested persons to its meeting. Community involvement at board meetings is encouraged so that the board can better understand and represent the views of its constituents. Please be aware, however, that information such as individual student information or particular personnel issues cannot be discussed at public sessions of the board. Speakers will be called upon individually when recognized by the board president will be asked to approach the podium and state your name and residence. Statements are restricted to a maximum of two minutes and speakers will be notified by the board president when his or her time is expires. The board and the district staff take public comment very seriously. However, the board will not respond to comments or questions during the public comment period. The board asks the public's cooperation in maintaining a safe and respectful environment, and the board president reserves the right to limit individual comments if it is deemed necessary. And to achieve this, speakers will not make slanderous attacks on any group, organization, or individual. A member of the board, an employee of the district, a member of the audience, or a member of the public use profane, vulgar, threatening, or disparaging language or racial or ethnic slurs, or disrupt the meeting with loud outbursts or any other disruptive conduct or behavior, either during the speaker's assigned time or at any other time during the meeting. Speakers understand that a failure to comply with these rules for maintaining a respectful and productive environment may result in early termination of the speaker's allotted time, a denial of future requests to speak, and any other actions deemed necessary by the president of the board or where appropriate in matters of health or safety, the superintendent of schools. And so, uh, Mayor Rossi, would you please approach the podium? Did I really force you to read that whole thing as the only speaker, I think? <laughs> Frank Rossi, Jr., 63B, Saratoga Avenue, Balsa Spa. Uh, first off, uh, Jason, to you and your family, thank you for the donation you made uh, toward the St. Baldrick's event on Saturday. Uh, my numbers paled in comparison to the Malta Avenue team. Uh, $10,000, I think it was, uh, that they raised out of the $30,000-plus uh, toward children or childhood cancer especially. Uh, it was just amazing. So thank you to uh, you and your family for your donation uh, on uh, my team. Uh, want to uh, say that tomorrow night I'm excited to go to Beauty and the Beast because it's my first break really after doing our budget. Good luck, Superintendent, uh, on uh, getting yours uh, finished up soon. Uh, but a tentative budget is uh, always a, a good learning experience for everybody. I wanted to just remind everybody here uh, of something that I posted last week, uh, that there is a cannabis dispensary that has uh, applied or an applicant that would like to uh, locate one where Russell's Deli is located currently. Uh, we have a 30-day window to give comments generally about the location and or the uh, potential operator. Uh, I plan on using some of this period of time to get the comments of people uh, in our community, including anybody that wants to uh, from the school district or school board. If there's anything you would like to include, feel free to. Uh, I will package it up, summarize it to the state and um, you know, make sure that the best location is being picked if one is going to be picked for the Village of Balsa Spa and that uh, the best possible operator is uh, in that position as well because obviously uh, there's a lot of gravity behind the situation like a canvas dispensary, uh, much like a bar or liquor store and other, uh, let's say, uh, interesting stores uh, that can pop up throughout communities like ours. But uh, our village did not opt out in 2021, which was the deadline to do so for dispensaries and for uh, lounges. And so there's nothing we can do per se to stop a cannabis dispensary from locating in the village. It's just a question of now doing the right thing, giving it its full review, et cetera. I know that it can affect the school district. So we just wanna make sure we're doing the right things. Uh, finally, uh, I want to thank uh, Principal Robinson for including me in the stakeholders uh, group uh, that uh, has been meeting here in the high school to talk about uh, how the high school is operating, ideas he has bouncing off of us uh, and whatnot. Uh, I bounced off the idea of having some banners in our community, again, dedicated toward the high school uh, to celebrate the achievements, not just athletically, but academically as well and something to look at. And just final thought briefly, if I may, that having all the sports uh, teams here is always a big thing because 
as you know, I am highly involved in Division Three athletics uh, nationally, and Boston Spa has a name out there because of the student athletes, many of whom uh, we see here tonight and in the past, that has just exemplified the spirit here of Scotty's and you know, just what we're all about around here. Our names are inextricably linked. I said it the first time I ever spoke to you because of the school district being Balsam Spa and the village being Balsam Spa. We may not be the same, but we are basically when it comes to people identifying with Balsam Spa. And so I would love to include a sign, a Welcome to the Village Balsam Spa sign that says essentially the accomplishments of state and national championships that our village student athletes have attained or our school district student athletes have attained because Boston's got two school districts in it and you know the village at least is the primary. So we would like to invite you to maybe uh, bring some ideas to us on how we can effectively do that, the wording, et cetera. Let's celebrate uh, more of what we just saw here earlier tonight. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Rossi, for your comments, and um, we very much uh, appreciate the partnership and the consideration that the village gives our school district, and we certainly hope to reciprocate and also always consider uh, the village and our, our surrounding towns that make up our school district in all of our actions. Thank you. <coughs> Student government report. Kate. Hello everyone, happy spring. We had a successful health and wellness fair. Thank you to many individuals and groups who donated their time and resources for the event. The music department's pops concert was a great success, raising over $2,000 for seniors. Our biggest concert was followed by a music tour to our elementary schools that included the chamber orchestra, festival choir, and jazz band. Congratulations to the robotics team for winning the Creativity Award this past weekend at the Finger Lakes competition, and good luck this weekend. As you can see by tonight's preview of Beauty and the Beast, the student body is very excited for the musical. We hope to see you at one of the five shows. Lastly, spring sports are off to a great start, and congratulations to all of our winter athletes on a successful conclusion of your season. Thank you, and have a wonderful break. Thank you. Any questions for our student government? Thank you very much for the report, and you may excuse yourself. I have a motion to approve the minutes for the March 6, 2024 regular meeting. Any amendments or additions? Not hearing any, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Minutes are approved. Our superintendent's report. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Furneaux. Uh, we have two reports tonight. Our first report, I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Motler and Ms. Pusatier up from our professional development committee for an update on the work that this committee has been doing all year. Um, so good evening, Dr. Duca and members of the board. Thank you for having us back again this year. We were here at the same time last year to report our work that we had done um, by this time last year. Um, so we're just going to run through a little bit of the work that we've been doing this year. Um, every presentation that we do, whether it is um, here or we present at faculty meetings a lot as well, we always start with this slide, um, and as I said last year, it is to thank these committee members. We would never accomplish the amount of work that we accomplish in a year if we did not have this group of people who are volunteers. They are volunteer educators who believe in this work. Um, if we did not have this group, we would never be able to pull um, a lot of this off. So I'll start by talking about our um, I think the biggest accomplishment this year was the October 20th Superintendent's Conference Day. We had not had uh, a day like this in 
Um, Kim and I were talking about it maybe 15 or 16 years. Um, and even when we did, it wasn't really a day like, like this. Um, we had 54 offerings that day. Um, 620 employees came um, to those professional development sessions. Um, all of the offerings fell under these um, five areas. Um, noteworthy is only two presenters were outside presenters that we brought in um, and all of the other sessions were created by and facilitated by all of our own staff members. You know, the, the talent that is in this district um, and the expertise that people have that we never knew really made this day um, what it was. Um, we surveyed staff after, so you see a couple of the little uh, testimonial uh, comments that are in italics, I won't read them. Um, but we, we, we um, put out a survey to staff. 89% of staff said that all of the sessions they attended fully met their professional development needs that day. So, um, and then people said, you know, things like, like this. Um, I look at this, this is my favorite slide of, of tonight. One, because whoever made this comment, and they were anonymous, noticed that all of the presenters were all of their colleagues, and then also noticed that um, it's super cost effective. Uh, so 620 people were able to come to a full day conference like this for $6,000. Um, that's like between nine and 10 bucks a person. You can't go outside of the district um, and, and have a day like this or be part of a day like this for under probably $150. So, um, and I was telling Dr. Duca this earlier today and I said, Brian will be logically thinking, that's not true, it's not $9, we're still paying their daily rate, so. But uh, I'm ignoring that and I'm celebrating our $9 a person day. Uh, so, uh, anyway, it was a great day. We're planning uh, a day next year. It will be November 1st um, because I, we love our teachers and it's the day after Halloween. Um, so the kids will, will not be here um, eating candy all day that day. Um, we'll just run through just uh, a couple of our subcommittee updates. This is one of them. It's the new employee orientation onboarding program. This committee has oversight of the three uh, orientation days in August. Um, not only do they build the days, this subcommittee facilitates those three days. The um, annual professional performance review offerings, uh, and I think we've had probably over 10 of them um, this year. These are sessions for new teachers um, on the Danielson rubric, and the Danielson rubric is um, that framework uh, is what we use uh, to evaluate our teachers when we observe them. Um, so this group, you know, runs those. Elementary curriculum, residency. Uh, Kathleen Skelly and her team, I, I give full credit uh, for this. This is elementary level. First year teachers get four half days release time to work with Kathleen and her team. Second year teachers get two half days to work with her and her team. Um, and it is, it is really, really well received. Um, our mentor coordinators partner with this subcommittee um, and over time, I think probably over four years time, we've created sort of a tiered professional development for new teachers in the mentor program. In our district, you are in that mentoring program for three years. It doesn't matter if you're an eight-year veteran, you, you, you didn't spend eight years here. So, but we have a differentiated approach because a first year teacher doesn't necessarily now need exactly what a, a third year teacher in the program would need. Um, so that's that committee. I'll let Kim talk about a couple of more and then a sneak peek at next year. You want this or you I'll let you do it. So our second subcommittee is our professional development to improve professional practice. So research shows that positive conditions for learning contribute to students being engaged and attending school regularly. 
In addition, research indicates that strong relationships with adults is the biggest predictor of good attendance. As a result, we developed the Strengthening Positive Conditions for Learning series, and we have three areas within that series. The first is classroom protocols. To highlight a few examples of things we've offered, it includes fostering inclusive learning environments, grading for success, um, managing challenging and disruptive behaviors, maximizing group work, and cooperative learning. Our second, instructional strategies is our second category, um, and some to highlight a few workshops, building success through formative assessment, differentiating the content, process, product, and or environment, identifying the essential components to gauge student success, interactive learning strategies, and summarization for student success. And our third area is student and staff wellness. To highlight some examples of workshops, bringing nature into the classroom, building classroom community and making connections, chair yoga, incorporating brain breaks, um, mindfulness for physical well-being, and the rise of anxiety in youth. Our third sub subcommittee is professional learning communities, or commonly known as PLCs, um, displayed are what we offered this year. So staff propose the topics, and participants join a PLC that best fits their needs. Um, these are, you know, when's on time or that, but these are usually generally well attended. And in some cases, you know, they, a PLC could last two or three years based on the needs of the group. Our fourth subcommittee is our book studies research and review team. Um, in a book study, participants read a common text and then reflect on the reading, considering how using the content knowledge applies, to the content gained um, applies to their practice and consider possible implementation ideas. Again, staff propose the topics or the titles of a potential book study, um, and participants join a book study that best suits their needs and displayed are what we offered this year to date. Um, this year, we partnered with the Building Better Futures um, LLC. This is the first time in my career we've done anything like this. Um, and this has been an opportunity for both parents and staff to attend a series of virtual presentations. As you can see, these topics are very timely and relevant. Um, these have been really well received and there's been a high participation. As Pam mentioned, we are planning our spring Superintendent's Conference Day, so we do appreciate um, the opportunity. The format of the day, so in the morning we'll start with choice sessions. Uh, participants have an options of 33 different choices, 31 of which are all presented again um, by our staff members. And then the afternoon we divide it it into an opportunity for collaboration. This could be teachers working as a co-teaching partnership. It could be a grade level department, um, whatever they need. Um, and then it also allows us to um, complete the mandatory training related to violence in the workplace. Looking ahead to next year, we will continue to refine and enhance our new employee orientation and onboarding program. We'll have two professional learning series next year. Um, we'll continue our strengthening positive conditions for learning, um, as well as add diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as Pam mentioned, we'll also be busy working on our November, super, November 1st Superintendent's Conference Day. Any questions? <coughs> yes. Um, in, your, in your book studies, mm -hmm. what's the average size of a book for a book study? Like. Um, we like to keep it a ratio of one of 15 to one, one facilitator with 15 participants. If we go over 10, we typically add a second facilitator and then we'll increase the size. And do you see the same people coming back over and over to participate with different books? Like, you know, they're just, or do you see um, just more it, randomized? You do, you yeah, do. We okay. see some right. new, new books right. too. Mm -hmm. It depends on the nature of the books. If it's more content driven, you mm -hmm. see, you know, for instance, right. we've been doing a couple series related to math, mm -hmm. so you see more math oriented people. Um, it, like a lot with the social emotional learning type mm -hmm. related books, you get a greater diversity. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, you always, there's always typically a repeat, but there's also new people as well. I just also want to say that I really appreciate that this district doesn't just take the time to use professional development for department meeting time to mm -hmm. push, you know, the newest, hottest topic out there. Mm -hmm. You really let the um, faculty choose mm -hmm. what they want to do mm -hmm. and, and really let them have a voice and be a part of the committee as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it, it's really important to the district and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Like uh, most of our professional development, we give them like areas of focus and then we send out a survey with proposals. Anybody can submit a proposal either to facilitate or then we work to find somebody else. We and go I, through their descriptions correct. and, mm -hmm. and you know, they also have to have a, a pretty good knowledge base mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they prove that over time mm -hmm. um, before we, we give them a session, you know, a right. room full of right. 20 people. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for people who don't know that to understand that that is not the norm. This mm -hmm. is Boston Spa's going above and beyond and, and really letting the faculty you know, help facilitate what they feel is important to develop. And I think that's really important for you guys to, you know, make sure that you promote when you, when you say that, because that is not the norm when you go to other districts. Usually the administration is pushing an agenda and you're not doing that here. And I, I value that. That's very important. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Uh, how was the attendance been like for, the, for those good. sessions? Good, good. It was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we offered you know uh, like a viewing of it, and so yeah. some people attend the viewing, mm -hmm. and then it's offered for thirty days. It's open, oh. and we have uh, our staff members were able to utilize that thirty days to view the um, the session whenever mm -hmm. they wanted. Oh. Yes. Um, you know, once again, thank you for the Superintendent's Day last November. I was able to attend some sessions, yeah. and of course, it was my first one. Not, I'm not an educator, and uh, I asked, "So, is this how it normally goes?" Like, no, this is completely different than how it normally is. Uh, a lot of positive feedback. Yeah. Um, one of the things, and I think I saw it in there, like digital detective, which I thought was a very good topic. With you get all this information online, and how do you know fact from fiction, and what steps can you do to then fact check yourself, right? Um, so uh, I would definitely recommend that for any future um, uh, recommend, uh, courses because uh, I found that very useful Great. for anyone who's got Facebook. We'll tell her she <laughs> has to do it again? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Holly, did you have something? And I just wanted to add that I've had the, the pleasure of uh, attending the um, the summer orientation sessions happen right before um, our school year starts. And it's just incredible how there's an immediate focus on, you know, the work to be done, the professionalism of the district. And I think as a first impression, you know, for people coming in, it, it just is, is such a great reflection on our, um, our school district. So I wanna thank you and I also wanna um, just say how uh, appreciative we are of the partnership between all the various um, constituencies within our school district. Um, and I, I see Ms. McGowan is here, I wanna recognize her and the, the ATA is certainly part of this as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, seeing all those groups coming together uh, because they're invested in our district and again, there's just that focus on professionalism, and it, it comes from the, the onboarding of people here um, in our district and then continues with the, the events like we're talking about here. So this is wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I just say one, one thing as well. I just want to recognize the amount of time. They, they, they'll shortchange it. They put a lot of time, a lot of hours <clears throat> per week, per month. Um, with professional development in this district, and it doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you both. Thank you. And just seeing how many names are on that committee is really, really amazing. Thank you. In our next presentation, we have Mr. Siriani here to talk about the next budget review. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Brian. Tonight I was uh, hoping that we would have a, uh, a better picture of where the state budget was going, but um, it appears that you know things are not moving along very quickly, but from the outside that may not be true. We don't know. Uh, the, the Senate and the Assembly one-house budgets are very similar when it comes to uh, school aid. And that's good news, um, but apparently, uh, you know, the governor's office is, is quite a ways away from that 
uh, relative to additional aid for school districts. Just so everyone knows that the, uh, the one house budgets um, uh, included a 3% increase for uh, school districts. And the governor's, um, not only there was no increase in that sense, guaranteed increase, but uh, the uh, Save Harmless was rolled back and their school districts said, you know, quite frankly, are in a lot more difficult situation than we are. Um, we were basically level for foundation aid, but many school districts have lost uh, millions if the, uh, the current proposal goes through. I don't believe that it will because it would be devastating for many districts. Um, even wealthy school districts are, are finding themselves in very difficult situations. Uh, so we'll see how this plays out. Um, because of that, we're, we're spending a lot more time uh, with the budget this year, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Let's do that right now, in fact. Um, normally, we would be going over the instructional section of the budget, which is essentially three quarters of the budget. Um, but we're right now in the, in the process of, I, I wrote a conducting comprehensive program review, and uh, the superintendent and uh, the uh, program and operations superintendent, assistant superintendent are working with all the administrators to review all the programs in the district to see what, what is effective and uh, cost effective and also and you know, what isn't and how that will all play out because there will need to be cuts uh, in, in general, you know, regardless of where the aid comes through, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Uh, we would be in much better shape if we weren't losing, you know, over $800,000 in global aid or global uh, uh, pilot payments. Uh, that really puts us behind every year, and we've been doing that for a decade now. Um, but I'm going to talk about that because there's good news coming. I hope that everyone is aware of that. So what I'm going to do is I'll talk about a few other items that are important that are, are coming up uh, on the agenda, for example, and that is the propositions. So tonight the board will be uh, voting to approve propositions for uh, school vehicles, uh, the bus lifts, and uh, the public library. And I'll talk about each of the, the, the first two, but just I'll, I'll jump to the public library because there's not much to say there other than we've been doing this. I don't know, 30, 40 years at this district. And this is an obligation for a school district if a public library who is so situated uh, requests it, then the, the school district is obligated to you know, collect the tax uh, that they request. So that's a, a very simple thing. We collect that and then we, um, and we send that to them. Uh, first proposition, uh, school vehicles. So that's gonna be five uh, 72 passenger buses and three maintenance vehicles. And it's important to note that the district is not purchasing any uh, electric buses in this round of uh, purchases. Um, you know, some school districts are, some school districts aren't. It's all over the place. Uh, the, you know, given the state's difficulty to, you know, manage the foundation aid issue, it's, it's just uh, astounding that they're moving forward with this issue. But I, I'll be honest with you, I think it's going to keep going. I, I thought, uh, you know, six months ago that it wasn't going to keep moving, but I believe that it is. And so eventually, and in fact, next year, if it continues, we will need to buy uh, some school ve uh, electric vehicles, maybe just one or two, because uh, it fully kicks in in 2027, but we'll need to buy some to uh, basically get used to them, plan out our, our facilities, and also it allows us uh, to access some rebates and some grant money that apply to things related to studies and analysis. And, and until you have a bus, electric bus, you're not able to do that. Um, so we're gonna have to go forward with that uh, if, if it plays out the way that it is. We'll see. Uh, there are proposals to change, for example. Her, the proposal was to uh, spread the cost of these buses over 12 years. Uh, you know, to keep a bus for 12 years is very difficult, and that was a change in the governor's proposal, you know, in, you know imposing the, the mandate and then spreading the cost over a longer period of time that they'll pay you back for it. Um, just really difficult uh, financially. So we'll see how that plays out. But um, you know, 72 passenger buses are a little bit large for us. We, we uh, have been buying 68 passenger buses, uh, but these are all coming up. They're, they're probably 10 years old, and um, they uh, 
are helpful because we have a mix. It's not like we have all of one type of bus. In this case, we put these on routes where you have more kids, that the route is longer, and we're actually trying, and, and, and not trying, just trying, but have accomplished consolidation of routes this year so that we have less routes because we have less drivers. Uh, it, it puts kids on the bus a little longer, but we try to minimize that. We're not keeping kids on the bus uh, any longer than we have to. Um, but the 72 passenger buses uh, give that uh, ability. Uh, they also allow us, uh, uh, they're important for our sports teams because uh, several of these, uh, three I believe out of the five, actually have the extra storage on the bottom of the bus for all of the athletic equipment and stuff. And so this is again why you, know, you have this mix and uh, I think our bus garage does a great job of you know, only buying what we need and when we need it. Three maintenance vehicles um, are classic stuff. One is a, a, a big truck, a plow truck and sander and all that for our parking lots. We do all of our own uh, unless there's a, an emergency. If it's something really huge, then we do have contractors on call. Um, and a couple of our maintenance uh, vans, and these are for our uh, maintenance guys who are specialists in uh, HVAC, plumbing, electrical. Um, we don't have a lot of storage in the district for uh, this type of stuff, so what we do is we have these vans, you know, basically kitted out and ready to go so that they have all the plumbing and stuff that they would want in there, and then they drive and they go to the school facilities and, and do their work. So that's what the uh, replacement of a couple of those. Uh, those date from uh, 2013, I believe. So uh, moving on, the bus lifts. Now this is different. We haven't done this. I look back, and, and so it's going to be new to this board, but back in 2011, uh, and prior to that, uh, and when I got here in 2005, it was a regular occurrence that there would be uh, a separate proposition on the May vote for anywhere from a half a million to a million and a half dollars. And, and this was a great practice, I thought, when I got here, because what it did is, is it, it didn't push off lar everything into big, large projects that then things became kind of a crisis. And, uh, and instead, the smaller things that could be done and needed to be done were done on this, in, this interval. But then with the large projects that we did do over the last few years, our last uh, decade and a half, uh, they became unnecessary because things were rolled into those big projects. But we're back to this, and, and this, this issue right here is a big one. Um, the, these very large lifts that you see here, um, they're both uh, 20, over 20 years old now, and they are uh, causing all kinds of trouble. They don't want to work anymore. I guess I wish I could stop after 20 years, but they've decided that they're done. And um, it, it is, it is a quite a task. Uh, the, the normal buses that we have now, this is a, uh, this is a, a 68 passenger bus. They weigh about 17, 18,000 pounds. Uh, we know that uh, we're going to see buses with the electric buses of over 36,000 pounds, maybe even 40 or more when we get to those electric buses. And these are rated capacity of 64,000 uh, uh, pounds. So uh, the, the, another great part of this is that uh, they can be done in place during the, the school year so we can get this done right away. And why is it so important is because uh, right now one of them won't even move and is set in place and the other one if it goes down, we have multiple buses that we can't lift. Um, so this has to be done, and our, our, our review of projects said this, this can't wait another year uh, for uh, our big project, and because after that, then it's even time after that to do it. This can be done right away. Uh, it's, it's, it's expensive because one is, is the size and the, and the safety features associated with these, but also the, this includes the removal, you know, jackhammering into this concrete floor that you see here, removing the old buses, being prepared for any kind of remediation needed for oil, soil contamination, et cetera, and then installing the new buses, or, or the new lifts, excuse me. But um, this can actually be done one at a time and will be during the school year. So um, we'll do that. Y yes? The, each one has two pistons. Okay, so there's two lifts, and they're right by, the other one is literally, if, you, if you're standing where I was standing, was where the other lift is. That's the one that doesn't move anymore. They actually, uh, and not that we're gonna get, I don't wanna give too much to, you know, for everyone here, but these, these things right here, you see this right here, this can move, and that allows it to like put the jack under the axle of a shorter bus or a longer bus. And this right here is a, a vital part of this because otherwise you can't adjust. Well, like I said, one of them, you know, they can get it to move if they go down in, and I, I looked into the, looked down in there, and it's, it's quite a, a, a rusty old mess. Um, they can do it, but it, it, it's, it takes them hours to try and move this track. So, you know, without, you know, 
too much detail here. You know, obviously it's a big deal. Uh, they're needed for the new buses anyways that we're going to, so we need to do it now and that's why it's proposed, okay? Um, now I'm gonna skip to uh, student enrollment. It's something that we don't usually talk about, but we need to, to kind of talk about as we go into this year's budget. Um, this is a graph going back to, to 2008. I hope that that's readable uh, over there on the left. Uh, we had in district 400 or 4,409 students. And over time, um, we're down now uh, uh, to right here to 3,860. And this, does, this is in district, but there are only about 30, it, it varies of 30 special education students that are out of district in that sense. So uh, that's the vast majority of the students. And you can see that slow progression that has gone on over you know, more than a, a decade here. But what I want to point out is this right here. And if everybody remembers, this is when the Global Foundries plant was built and came online. And we saw a quick jump um, right there of students. And uh, you know it's like 150 students approximately. Uh, that was interesting. We, th we expected more at the time. And we didn't really get them. Uh, we know that some of the students are uh, in Shen, some of the students are in uh, Saratoga Springs, some of them are in Stillwater, Mechanicville, et cetera. But uh, we didn't get as many as we thought, but we certainly, it, it impacted us. Um, and I expect that uh, when they build the new plant, which I'm gonna talk about next, that we're gonna see another jump up here. How big it'll be, I don't know. Um, we thought one way, but uh, y you know, even our folks at the, uh, the Capital District Planning Commissioner, it's hard to judge where people will choose. One of the issues is, is where is the available housing? In today's market, you know, back in 2011, there was a, the housing stock was very large. Today, it is very limited, and there's gotta be houses available to move into. That's why we're seeing so many apartment complexes being built in the area, uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of units and that's kind of taking up the slack because of uh, the lack of uh, physical houses. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, what, is, what does this mean? So as everyone knows, the, the, uh, the Global Foundries has received the you know, multi-billion dollar uh, you know, subsidies from the state and federal government, and they plan to move forward. Um, you know, different stories are that it should start this spring. All right, so what does the district get out of that? The district starts to get uh, every year some piece of that construction as it's partially assessed as the building goes up. So that, that took about three years back in 2011 and it'll take probably about the same amount of time um, unless there's a new process for them. We don't know uh, much about what they do or how they do it. We're kind of looking in from the outside but clearly a new factory is coming and that's great news for our pilot payment revenue. So as I mentioned, we were losing about $800,000 this year uh, that we're in, and we're projected to lose another $400,000 uh, next year. Um, this, depending on how quickly it gets built, can dramatically increase, and it can be, you know, it might be a few hundred thousand in the first year or second year, but it'll, it'll grow into the millions like it did before. So that will offset our loss, and in fact, uh, starts to subsidize uh, the, the rest of the district, and hopefully that'll be a good thing over the next you know, 10 or 15 years for, for the school district. Um, how it will increase uh, enrollment, we don't know, but you know, they've predicted you know, several thousand new employees, and uh, that'll play out somehow in, in what that means for us. That is all uh, working into the uh, analysis and review that the administration is doing relative to how many staff do we need, where do we need them, and, and what does it mean for our programs for basically the next decade? And those are the things that need to be worked out um, you know, this year, next year, and the following year. But uh, I'm, I'm, next year is, uh, is, right now is financially difficult, but the future is actually quite bright for Balsam Spa uh, because of that plant uh, for no other reason. Um, so that's, that's important news. Um, so the next meeting is April 10th. Um, the, the state budget is due April 1st, and that'll be critical. Um, my, the things that I've heard is that they, they do not expect to have the budget on time. That's not good. If they have it uh, by the 10th, you know, if it comes in on the 9th or something, it'll be very difficult to incorporate that in where we will try. I'm hearing the 15th, which means it will be before 
for the next meeting of the, the, uh, the following meeting, which is the 17th. But it'll give us very little time to incorporate that into what we're doing. But it will clearly be the rest of the expenses, regardless, and uh, revenue updates if we have them. So that's the next two meetings are going to be critical. And uh, we'll see how it plays out. Any questions? Okay, thank you. No, yes. So with the, um, the new pilot for the new, new building, do we anticipate it would be a jump up to some number and then the gradual It'll decrease, be the same thing. The, and then the, the level off. Exactly, the formula is, is the same. It's already built into the pilot agreement from you know, back in 2010, 2008, I think it was signed. Um, so it, it's set, we, you know, depending on how, much, how quickly they construct it, it'll, it'll have a number associated to it. And then that'll, that, as you said, as it gets, it'll hit maximum uh, assessment, and then it has a roll off over a certain period of time. So we'll see the same thing, but um, I mean, we're way out um, on this, and you know, this one, this the current one will, will level on 2028, and will then start to go up itself also. Okay. It'll go up again because now it will no longer have this built-in uh, depreciation on the value of the building. Mm -hmm. That's what's been happening over the last 15 years. Um, and then, it, and then it will grow grow with our tax rate. Oh, okay. So that's good news too. All right. All right. So okay. the two of them will kind of kind of interplay, and 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 it'll be very unpredictable. But we'll we'll do our best to deal with it. Yes. Just a question on the life cycle of a bus. Could you? How long do we typically? Well, we we try to replace the buses, uh, you know, every ten years, okay. but it depends. Um, it's interesting because. Uh, uh, the the COVID pandemic, and we had a year where you know normally the, the, we drive over 900,000 miles with our buses. Uh, that one was less than I think uh, 550 or something, and the following year was less also. So it actually kind of saved us some mileage on the buses. But mileage isn't really the the thing that is the the greatest dictator of the buses. It's really uh, rust. And, and that's, it's just, it's unbelievable. It is a very large vehicle with a lot of metal and they rust. And where, where the rust would be acceptable on a, on a personal passenger car, you know, it, it's, it's something that is, you know, let's say uh, cosmetic. In this case, it involves uh, the undercarriage of the bus, the structural integrity, and of course, all the parts, including the brakes. And um, they won't pass the constant inspections. So unlike you know, your normal car, these buses are, are regularly inspected by the DOT who actually comes to our garage, puts them up on the lift, goes through them and does all this, and it gets to a point where the bus is not viable to spend the money to do the repairs uh, relative to that. So that's, obviously uh, mileage plays into that, but time does too. And, um, and it's a concern that actually has come up with the electric buses that you know, these things are gonna be rusting underneath and what are they gonna do, and maybe that's why they're so much more expensive, what are they gonna do to prevent that underneath uh, where these, uh, the batteries will be? Uh, they're basically exposed. I mean, the bottom of the buses are exposed right now and, and, and maybe there's a different design, I, I don't know. Okay. Yes. To kind of follow up on that bus question, um, so if we do start to buy electric buses next year, obviously we got to buy some infrastructure to charge them. Mm -hmm. um, is that do we have space currently at the transportation facility to start to put that in if we have to buy two or three or whatever? We, to buy a small number, we certainly do. Okay. okay. Um, when we have to go to the full fleet, that's going to become a whole nother animal. So um, you'll have to in the in the in the lot there. Uh, you know, right now we have the electrical supply there to provide uh, bus heaters for the engine heater, block heaters. That won't be sufficient for level three or level two, uh, you know, uh, battery uh, chargers. So there'll be a, a lot of change there. And there's a whole bunch of issues. So, so for example, um, although it's not a part of law or any kind of like national code, because it really isn't a, a, a consistent code yet on, on this, and it's some of the stuff that we've been attending these conferences on and seminars, um, but insurance companies are suggesting instead that you wanna park these things 10 feet apart because if one starts on fire, then you, you don't take out your whole, your whole fleet. Well, if we have to separate them by 10 or 15 feet, we'll need more space than our lot. And we're not alone. Every school district will face this type of thing with, with do you have enough? And, and if you have to buy more buses because the range is so limited that you need extra buses on hand, now you need more space in your lot. So this thing just cascades on and on 
Um, and it's, you know, it is problematic and we'll just see how it plays out. Uh, you know, the, the second round, uh, the thing that we learned, and I think this is actually the case in my own research, the second round of really good batteries, these solid state batteries, are really going to be kind of commercially viable and manufacturable in 2030. It sure would be great if we could wait to 2030 to do this because the cost will be down, the range will be greater, it won't be first generation, you know, technology that we're dealing with now. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone saw the article on Bethlehem where they have seven of these in fiber in, in repair and they had two available on the day of this, uh, this review because there's just issues. It, it's, it's, it's like buying something that never existed before. And, and why, you know, to, to force us to do this is, is in, in my opinion, you know, um, problematic and not wise. With, with the infrastructure, you know, like to add a couple stations for the, say we have to buy two or three buses next year, would that be part of the, the uh, proposition to buy the buses? or would that No, be it would have to be separate because it's a, it's a, so the buses that we receive, by the way, we get aid uh, 64, 65%, 64.9% is aided. So that's great news. So we don't really pay for all that. And that would help with the other, the other buses, but it'll be just that much more, double the price. Um, but when you do physical infrastructure, that's a capital project. So that's like, um, you know, our building projects and things. Like, like the lifts, that's a capital project. We get 75% aid on that, okay, this district. So 75% of that. So, you know, out of this thing, you know, we won't be actually even, you know, having to make payments on the BIS lifts until 2026. Um, and, and then it will be paid at, you know, 75%. Um, the... So when we start adding those, those items, either they'll be a part of a project, you know, we have those capital outlay projects, uh, that's aided the same way. And we could, in, in within the, the budget actually, put a capital outlay to add a few of these chargers. Okay. And we would apply for the, the associated grants, et cetera, that, which brings down the cost right now. And since you only have a couple of this, these, you don't, you, this isn't a, a huge thing. In fact, one of the issues is, what is the power at the street? And right now we're getting that analyzed by, every school district in the state is getting that analyzed by, you know, National Grid or their associated uh, provider. But right now we already have a 400 or 480 vote, 480 vote, uh, vote um, transformer at the front of our garage. That's unusual. Usually it's 220 or 208 or in that range. And so we're kind of already set to, you know, start adding some of this stuff. How much capacity is left in that transformer is one of the analysis that has to be done. Every, again, every school district is doing that to see what they have. And then there's the capacity of what's coming in from, from on the lines. So we'll be doing all that. There's a report due by this school district and every school district on August 1st about where we are in the process of moving forward with this. Okay, okay so, so again, that's just a report that we're doing and it, it doesn't commit us to anything at this point. Thank you. Yes, Holly. Um, I applaud you for being cautious on adopting the electric buses. I was a big proponent of one. We actually own one in my home that I cannot park in the garage right now <laughs> because of the fire hazard yes. that the battery is um, currently. Um, but I also, at my job, have an electric trolley that I took oversight on in August, and it has been out three times for lengthy repairs, yeah. um, just because the technology isn't it's, there it's new. yet. It's, it's new. It's just not there yet. We understand that, and that's okay. and these, the folks that are designing this and building this, this is great, but, you know, you, you, you hate to be the, you know, the first people on the, on the, the road here because it's just going to be problematic. There's no doubt. Yeah, well, all of our connections will, will have to be trained or retrained, rather, to deal with this. I mean, it's basically electrician stuff versus mechanical stuff. Um, I don't know if you saw that. Or the <laughs>
A any questions not involving electric buses? <laughs> Good. Oh. Yes. There, there weren't. Well, it, it did um, because ultimately the school districts, and it was both uh, Stillwater and Boston Spa, had to approve it and were at the table in the sense. Uh, there weren't really any state officials at this. This was more uh, the Saratoga IDA and and the school districts and the and the in the town specifically Malta rather. Yeah. Yeah, so what it did is it, it, it's actually written in a way that anticipates a second plant and says any future plant will be based on these schedules, blah, 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 and, and goes on and, and deals with it. it, deals with, and it it's not just plants, but offices and other ancillary uh, uh, buildings. Yes, yes, we hope that that's the case. Um, there, there could be an issue where if uh, Global decides that they're not, you know, happy with the way with the uh, dollar figures that are in there, uh, they could challenge it. In fact, maybe the, the town could challenge it, um, but I, I don't see that right now. Thanks. That concludes our report. Okay. Uh, we had eight total this time frame, three phone calls regarding student matters, five emails, two regarding transportation, two regarding the solar eclipse, and one regarding a student matter. Thank you. There was no correspondence to the board since the last meeting. Announcements, employees. Thank you. Um, I think everybody covered my announcements already, so sorry. The, uh, but just to remind you, Beauty and the Beast this weekend, five performances. The, um, the Parents as Partner webinar series does continue tomorrow night, so that was mentioned earlier. So session 10 is tomorrow night. It's the one that's on focusing on knowing and communicating feelings and needs. So that'll be available. It's a Zoom meeting at 6.30 tomorrow night. So if you're not at Beauty and the Beast, you can be watching this, this webinar. Um, the robotics team is headed to the regional tournament um, Friday and Saturday. They'll be down at the... Um, whatever we're calling it now, um, MVP Arena. Um, used to, it's been several things. And uh, the, the kids, obviously, they go down on Thursday. They get it all set up and ready to go. And then the competitions, you're welcome to go see it. It's free. It's open to the public um, pretty much all day Friday and Saturday. The schedule will be out on Friday, and we'll shoot it out and or post it wherever we can. And there's usually a live feed, so you can actually watch it. Um, as long as you can understand what's happening, then you can you can see what they're doing with this year's um, their robots. So they're very excited about that. Then you heard reference to the spring race recess, which is March 29th through April 5th, and classes resume on the 8th, and your next meeting's on the 10th. Thank you, Stuart. Any announcements from our liaisons? Any old business? Okay, moving on to new business. I have a motion to approve resolution number 443, adoption of the 2024-2025 district calendar. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Ryan. Um, yeah, I was looking at the, at the calendar and counting days. And, um, I did notice that January 29th is a new um, school holiday with the Asian Lunar New Year, which I thought was didn't occur to me that we had that. Um, and I so Googled and then figured out that uh, it was just on into law last fall. Um, and it didn't affect this school year because it happened to fall on a Saturday. Um, I do see that we're at 182 days for this versus this current school year. We're at 183. So um, by having that um, in there, does that affect um, uh, how the school district can set up the, the calendar. Is it another constraint from the state for uh, building in and getting um, the 180 days? 
So it doesn't really affect the um, the building of it. It, it just allow it, it. You know, it's another day that we have to factor in when, when we're yeah. building it out. So um, you know, it does it does present a challenge as far as you know if we want to do a superintendent's conference day or, or if there's some other days worked in. Um, but we're we're we, we're able to. Um, come up with this schedule, uh, excuse me, calendar uh, to factor in the, the Asian Lunar New Year um, along with some other days. Um, and we still, we still are at 185 total days with three, built in three superintendent conference days. Okay. So not so much next year. Gotcha. So we're, okay. We're, we're, and I just see we do have kind of an extended December recess because of the way the calendar r runs. It, yeah, we did the, so. the additional two days um, yeah. to, for the two complete weeks. And I think it happens once every seven years or so. So we're okay. going to work that in. All right. Um, and I guess just kind of my other thought with with um, with this is I asked Dr. Drick to, to let me know what was the statistics for um, Asian population within a district. It's about 2 percent and New York State's about 11 percent. Um, and I and we have not received any specific requests for, hey, can we include the Lunar New Year in the, when you build the calendar uh, because of district um, uh, uh, partners. The other thing is just kind of looking at, I know other school districts do incorporate uh, Jewish holidays and New York State is roughly, coincidentally, about 11% uh, Jewish as well. So the state is kind of um, picking and choosing uh, and I really don't care either way. Um, my bigger thing is the mandate that is coming down and I would rather see that the local school districts get to choose what their demographics and what they need to offer. So. Um, it kind of dovetails into what we talked about last fall with NISBA and their legislative ad advocacy. Um, so I'm kind of putting this as a, as a one line item item that we would uh, present to NISBA to say, hey, can we advocate? And this is going to be kind of an uphill climb that's already written into law, but um, to back this one out, if, if so, but any future ones, we really want to make sure that local uh, school districts have more of a choice versus a statewide mandate because the uh, demographics are different everywhere. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Any, I don't know if there's any comments from my board. I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm wondering what you're, I guess, really asking for here. And it sounds like that you think that potentially there's some sort of threshold or criteria for a recognition? I, I don't know what criteria the state is using to decide that. I view this as um, where I kind of, I mean, it is what it is, but where I'm kind of looking for the future is um, putting on the NISBA's advocacy that the state does not mandate any other future school ho holidays um, without, I would say, cons at least consideration amongst the superintendents or, 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 or NISBA because it just, cons one, cons constrains the school districts to try to fit the 180 days in, and obviously we want the instruction days, but also have more local control than the state mandating what, what to do. Because one can make the argument there's a large percentage of Irish Americans um, and we don't get St. Patrick's Day off. And I'm not saying we should, but I'm just saying there's all these things coming into play that it should be, um, you know, I was just surprised that this was actually put into law when, when I went researching it, so. So if you're asking what they, they ask is, is to consider over the summer or whatever, wherever we're gonna convene about any legislative advocacies that we want to do, that this be one of the topics. Something to think about. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I mean, I, I have to think about what you just said. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll have to go back and, and listen again. I'm not sure. Are you advocating against the lunar holiday because we don't have enough, in, you know, people in our community who would celebrate it? That's what I'm kind of confused about. I'm, I'm not for or against the lunar holiday okay. or Jewish holidays or anything else. Um, I'd like the 
the option for the state to say to school districts, um, if you feel that this is an important part of your community, that you can set up your calendar as such. Um, I know, more, like I said, more, other school districts set that up for, for Jewish holidays because they have a larger um, Jewish population within their school district. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not happy that in New York State doesn't have to be hap make me happy, right? But that they, you know, mandate, mandated that regardless, you, you, you must do this. So uh, I'm more of a local choice. I'm having more of a local choice, yes. So, um, and I know their, their, their premise was coming from a, 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 a good point of inclusion and <clears throat> learning about another culture. Um, I just don't know, you know, I'd rather take, put the kids in school and let's do something to learn about that day and, and what it is versus, you know, um, you know, take some time out of the instruction day to do that versus it being a school day off. Well, you could have the same argument for President's Day, Martin Luther King, you know, we have all of those days off. But you could, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying if we're going to take learning opportunities, we should also take, you should also, yeah. you should but, add those to the, that list too, because those are learning opportunities for students as yeah. well. I, I also, I mean, other arguments, um, when researchers and superintendents had, um, you know, difficulty in how do I incorporate this additional school holiday with keeping the 180 and knowing that we're going to have, you know, snow days and, and that type of thing. So, I mean, the other argument could be like, okay, well, yeah, it's fine, we'll do another school holiday, but now allow us to, to go down to 179 or 178. Not that I'm proponent in that because we do want more kids in the, in the classroom. You know, I'm just wondering I'm, how Shed does it so. with the Jewish holidays and adding this holiday. They go 187 days, that's how. Was that? They go 187 days okay. All right. yeah. on their school calendar. So they make it happen. They Such go to a... school a lot more days than, right. they don't get the day well, before things. You know, they, you know, certain school districts just make sacrifices for their communities. Like, you know, so you get a Jewish a holiday choice. off at Shen or, you know, another school right. district and you don't get the day before Thanksgiving or you don't get the, January 2nd and 3rd mm -hmm. of the two week Christmas break that Boston Spa is getting. So there are ways to fit it in. It is, it is difficult though, I, I agree with you. I think that you know, putting in all these holidays between Labor Day and June 30th is, is challenging. I'm not sure going after cultural like you know, advocating against <laughs> cultural days is some is a is I a is well, something. I, I don't think that's I don't I didn't interpret him that way. Well, yes, I that's how that's how I'm, I I'm, I'm seeing it. Choice. Like you're you're you know you're saying that that's I mean, why I said I, I, I want to take a minute. And so if, if the governor had said St. Patrick's Day should be a, a school holiday, I would still say I would not want that mandated. Right, but so, what yeah. I'm saying is like. You know, President's Day, where we celebrate the presidents, could be a day where we could be in school learning about the presidents. You know, but mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King Day could be a day where we're in school learning about Martin Luther King. You know, we have these days off built into you know, Veterans Day, things like that. You know, these are days where we have days off, mm -hmm. and have for a long time. Columbus Day or Indonesians Day, and where we could be in school learning cultural days. I'm not sure if that's a advocacy route, I personally am willing to, you know. Okay, we can just, I mean. And just I, my I think we've, opinion. We've, yeah. we've spoken a little bit about this before in terms of kind of what should a district's rule be and what should a district be advocating for. I, I think the logical extension of this is that for us to, um, offer ourselves up for having the option of kind of ranking or prioritizing certain cultural groups or other groups, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a very difficult thing, I think, for us to, uh, to approach. And, you know, there's discussion about, oh, well, we don't have local choice. Well, There are, in the United States and the world, 
less than half a percent of people who can't see at all. The American Disabilities Act in 1990 said that this building, many other buildings, are going to have signage that has Braille on it. There's an expense to that, there's a cost on that, there's a mandate coming down. Sort of advocating that for every single one of these things, we're going to try and have a position on or advocate a position for them. I think, again, I'm just not sure that's, that's some place that we want to go. I, I'm just not sure I see the, the upside to that. Well, I mean, first of all, I <laughs> did not say anything about the, the district taking a position about any specific group, ethnic or, or otherwise. I was talking about the state mandating something without local um, control of it. Um, and, the, and the signage is kind of really taking that argument because, I mean, one could say the school district how many days we have to try to fit in. That is our job to try to figure that out. Signage is not really our job, so. Well, you're talking about things that aren't necessarily in our control, and there are hundreds and thousands of them that are not in our control. And again, sort of saying, well, we're gonna pick and choose which ones that we want to um, have a position on have some sort of public position on, put time and energy and effort into, et cetera. I, I, I just, I, I struggle with, again, trying to, to figure out what the important, or what, what we, we would or shouldn't and, and how we justify that. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanna say, um, I, mean, I think there are good arguments on, it, it's a complicated set of questions. Um, I, I, for me, and this is outside the scope of um, adopting the district calendar, for me the criteria for when we as a board would decide to go to, to, the national, or to the state organization and advocate would be if we knew that this was very foreseeably going to have a, a significant negative impact on the students in our district, right? For me that would be the place where I would feel like as a board that's part of our job is to protect the interests of our students. I, I don't see this calendar issue as meeting that threshold for me. I know we had discussions last year about other issues and other advocacies. So I guess for me as a board member, the threshold would be I can immediately foresee a significant neg negative impact on students in our district. And again, I, I just wouldn't see this particular issue as meeting that threshold because again, you know, we're making the calendar work and we've got, you know, not a huge amount of wiggle room, but we've, we've got some choices and, and we're making this work, so. Thank you. Any other discussion? Not hearing any, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 443 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 444, Board of Education Policy Manual File 7351, limited authorized use of physical restraints. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 444 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 445, Board of Education Policy Manual File 7619, timeout rooms. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 445 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 446, Board of Education Policy Manual File 6123, Workplace Violence Prevention. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 446 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 447, Board of Education Policy Manual File 8330, objection to instructional and library materials. So moved. Second. Uh, I have discussion, so I know there's discussion. Any yeah. discussion? Who, who, who would like to start? Go ahead, Jason. Okay. 
so the current policy talks about instructional materials, library materials, a couple other things. And then it goes into great length about um, objections to instructional materials. And there's actually a section on uh, if you want to formally object to instructional materials, how do you do that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not really anything about library materials. The new version has uh, language that says that the policy and definitions applied both instructional material and library material. I am still finding that there is a, uh, a deficit, there's a gap in how instructional materials are to be um, handled in terms of an objection. So it goes right into a Boston Spa School Library Vision Vision, objectives, acquisitions, bunch of stuff on library materials, the selection procedures, and then the objection to library materials. But again, I, I don't see anything that handles the instructional material. And I, I kind of think that the policy should cover both of those and should have more detail on um, the process for objecting to instructional material. That's what I One question would be, do we have the same process exactly for instructional um, materials and library materials or um, that, uh, or is there a separate process? But either way, I think it just needs to be more clearly written. Um, the other question or concern I had about the policy was um, on page four, it says that the complainant is required to complete and submit the reconsideration form within five working days, but it's not clear within five working days of what, right? Are they? providing notice to the school district that they're going to be objecting to the material? Is it within the first five days of raising the objections? So again, the, the process of like what, what that, like what kicks off that five day deadline isn't clear to me as written. Um, and, and I would suggest that we really need to get some clarity on that because there's language later that says, um, you know, if it hasn't been in completed in five days, um, you know, then the, the clock has run out. And so I think we really need to be pretty airtight on that. Um, the other point I would have, and again, this is really, I think, more just a clarity of the writing, is that I think points four and five should be reversed in that section, the formal request for objection. Um, so the decision should be made at the board meeting should come after the, um, the appeal of the decision, right? So the, the committee decides that's communicated to the superintendent, the superintendent reviews it, and then it can go to the board if I'm understanding that process correctly. Um, but again, as, as written, I, it was not clear to me in reading it multiple times what that timeline was or what that sort of succession was. Other than that, I, I like the, um, the, the, I think the clarity of the roles and responsibility of the role of the rule review committee, I thought was uh, brought some just clarity to that process. Um, so I, you know, applaud the labor and work that went into this. Other discussion? Yes. Um, first, Drew, thank you. You picked up some things I, I didn't quite get, so I think that was very good points. Um, so a couple things um, for me, I, you know, on page one, right after the definitions, it just looks like there's a header missing as, as to what the next section is. So just kind of a, a clerical thing there. Um, and I guess kind of take a step back, was there any specific initiative that um, sparked the update to this procedure? Was a Erie one recommendation or change to state law or we just felt this needed to be updated? So on the recommendation of our, our attorneys, um, 
the goal is to try to combine the process for objection to library materials and instructional materials in one comprehensive um, policy with the you know, so it existed as a procedure so we wanted to be transparent to show exactly what the procedure was for appeal um, mm -hmm. and having you know the appendix uh, here as well with you know the library bill of rights and then appendix to the actual request for reconsideration form Okay. have that right up in our policy so that everybody can see you know what the, the, the overall procedure is if you're going to object to either a library material or instructional material <clears throat> just okay. a more comprehensive policy than what we had it, it was it was just lacking gotcha okay um i did know on on the original one at the very end um you know before it refers you to also policy 8320 it listed education law and a bunch of other mm -hmm. education laws um, and I didn't see that in the revised one, so I don't know if that was just a omission accidentally or if this policy doesn't cover those educational laws now. So just uh, make you aware of that. Um, and I did like some language. Um, we were talking about deselection when, hey, you know, resource is no longer needed uh, in, the, in the library. Uh, media specialist you know, obviously determines, determines that. And then the remove from resource and the reconsideration process. Um, you know, where in here is the word ban, which I think is nice. We're, we're having a, a, a discussion of appropriateness of materials in a school library. Um, uh, but one thing that I did see, which was on page six, uh, for talking about the committee, review committee that is formed to review uh, a resource, um, I like that the there's roles the review committee members are anonymous i agree with that i agree with that during our previous discussion on this topic um but it does say that um when the committee decides and votes um on the resource it says this will be a secret ballot vote and i guess i would disagree with that um if i'm a board member and i'm reviewing this i would like to know how did the parent vote versus how did the administrator vote versus how did the student vote um, uh, so I would strike that one sentence, this will be a secret ballot vote. I disagree with that. That sounds like something we would need yeah. legal counsel okay. on. And I'm not sure that I could have an informed opinion on it until we got some legal guidance on that. Okay. I mean, as a member of the policy committee, I disagree with that. I don't think that, you know, if it were to ever get leaked of who the parent or the student was, I would never want their vote to be known to the public. <clears throat> you know, if, if gossip were to get out into the community of who was on that committee, um, I would never want, the, especially the student, um, their vote to be known to the public. One I'm way not, or not saying to the public, but if, to, for the, the, if the board is gonna, re if this gets appealed to the board, the board should be aware of what role voted. I'm not saying the public should be aware. The public is gonna be aware of the, the result of the review committee. Why does it matter? Because if you have a five person uh, committee, three of them are district employees, one's a parent and one's a student, and the vote is three to two, where the, to me that, that speaks a little bit about maybe some biases in in the in the committee don't you think that you would mm, okay i would draw my statement i mean i i i would agree that um that that's a, a point where we would want some legal counsel on i will say that i think a, a ballot where people's uh, secret ballot is kind of a cornerstone of democracy, right? And so what we're talking about is getting community review of materials. So to me, having the ballots be, uh, you know, secret goes along with getting, being able to really get people's full and fair. It may be that an administrator on that review committee feels some pressure to vote a certain way, perceived or not, but a secret ballot really preserves the opportunity for people to actually really give their full input on that. So I would feel as a board member that who voted what is not as important to me as, the, as the, the count of the vote. 
when I'm reviewing that. Because again, my assumption is that being able to post a ballot in secret um, gives everybody the maximum chance of um, giving their, um, their true and honest, unbiased vote. So just my two cents. I would just add one thing is, do we do a secret ballot vote for any other committee in the district? And if we, so. Well, I don't know of any other anonymous committees in the district. Okay. Do we have any other anonymous committees in the district? Uh, no, I don't know. Okay. I mean, these the parent and the student are, you know, putting themselves out there, especially when it's a controversial book, the topic. And, and, you, and you might have a hard time getting uh, people on the committee if it's not a secret. Right. Ballot because they might feel pressure or they might ballot, feel yeah. antagonized after the fact, after their, whatever their vote is. So I, I, well, I mean, the committee itself is still anonymous. I mean, the book review we had last year, the board does not know who was on that committee. We still don't. So. Okay. So policy 1410, our policy on policies, <laughs> um, says that our options are, or the, pro the process is that we have our first and second reading. It says that um, <clears throat> policy draft may be amended at the second meeting. I think meaning that it gets proved to sit for the 28 days during that 28 day period. Um, I don't know, the policy committee might revisit what they want to do with it and then potentially an amended version could be um, shared at the second reading. So our options are to uh, vote down this resolution to approve, to, to put it up for the, the first read. Um, I guess everyone could abstain, which I believe would also not approve it. Um, or we could approve it and go with the policy language about that it would be amended at the second meeting. And I don't have a full understanding of which may be the most preferable path forward. Is there any guidance from the clerk? No, I mean, you've summarized it. Um, you know, there isn't, there isn't a, uh, a requirement that you approve it at the second meeting either. Uh, so you could amend it, have the um, policy committee meet and propose amendments and bring back a revised version that would then be discussed and you don't need to approve it. Then you could still go on and keep, you know, doing this for 28 day periods. <laughs> so just of note, uh, our policy committee does meet again April 10th, which would be in the window. Okay. So... I think I would offer my opinion as the board member that um, we uh, let the policy committee start again with this at the April 10th meeting. Um, so uh, I would, I'm gonna vote in a manner that will uh, let them start fresh with it at the April 10th meeting. And just to clarify, that could be an abstain vote basically books it back to the policy committee is that accurate or i'm just again trying unless to it has a majority of votes that approve it it okay. will not be approved okay uh, you could table it uh, yeah I, I don't understand why we can't table it and let us let the policy committee work on it until uh, i it, don't it's think not... we can table it because we've had a motion to vote on it i think since we've had a motion to vote on it we need to vote on it. If we were going to table it, we could have done it before. That's what we've done in prior meetings is before the motion's been made or the motion has actually been to table it. I, I don't know if we have a, any better guidance than that. But like I said, we made a motion to vote on it. Okay. So I understand we have to vote because we've got that motion in progress. The choices are to vote to approve, to vote to not approve, or to vote to abstain. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Those are your options. Okay. So approve depend, or, or not approve 
then it would only be approved if a majority of the members voted to approve it. Right, so and if it is not approved, sorry. You can't on. table it, so there is no vote of tabling it like Katie did. Like I said, already. I don't think we can because okay. we already have a motion gotcha. on the floor All right. to vote so, on the resolution. All right. To clarify, if we abstain, the policy committee can work on it until the 10th, at our meeting on the 10th, and we can revisit this on the 10th. Absolutely. If, if we all abstain or a majority abstains, it will not approve. Yeah. The, the, can, the, the first three 28 day waiting period so will not be approved. So then we can work on it on the 10th and then the 28th, that's not 28 days till the 10th. So then we'll have time to present it on the 10th and then as old business as part, yeah, yeah. and then be able to vote on it on the, in the 28 day well, period, whatever meeting that is, the next meeting after that. Correct? Because we have one on the 17th. Well, I think as a practical matter, it would be hard for the committee to do its work and get a written policy for a resolution vote that night. But I mean, maybe you think you can. At some point, it would come up for a first read, which would start the 28-day clock. And that would be a, one of our upcoming meetings. Okay. But as an example, if we abstained at the policy committee meeting on the 10th, came up with a written policy to share prior to the 17th, where people would have enough time to review it, a week to review it, then we could conceivably still vote on the 17th yes. with the amended, amended policy. As a, first, as a first read, right? And then that would do the 28 days. Yes. That makes sense. Uh, no, I think what Holly's saying and I think what our policy 1410 says yeah. is that we can vote to approve it, the, the motion that's on the floor, the resolution that's on the floor, we could vote to approve that, which is that it would be sitting for the 28 day period. Policy 14 says that within that 28 day period or at the second reading vote, which would be then the 28 days from tonight, an amended version can be presented. In which case, and I think that was where I started out with this, is we could vote to approve this, but then say that we would have an amended version and decide at the meeting on the 17th if we were going to vote to approve that amended version or we no. still didn't like that yeah. amended yeah. version okay. and yeah. we could yeah. vote down yes. that second vote okay. there. All right. Okay. So makes sense too. The, the fastest way to fast yes. track it would still be to approve Got this it. tonight. Okay. Right. Okay. So helpful. Same thing. Those are our options. Um, All right, so motion, uh, so we made the motion, we seconded it, we've had our discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Nay. Abstentions? So I believe we have an approval. Resolution number 447 is approved. I have a motion to approve resolution number 448, appointment of chairperson, chief inspectors, and election inspectors. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 448 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 449, state environmental quality review. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 449 passes. And uh, just a point of information, the next two resolutions we're going to have to do a roll call vote on. Resolution number 450, purchase of school vehicles bond proposition. Second. Any discussion? 
Not hearing any, I will start the roll. Mr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Dreher? Aye. Ms. Barker Flynn? Aye. Dr. Uh, aye. Ms. Whitmore? Aye. I vote aye. Resolution number 450 passes. <coughs> I have a motion to approve resolution number 451, bus lift replacement proposition. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Not hearing any. I'll start the roll call. Mr. Ryan? Aye. Aye. Ms. Parker Flynn? Aye. Aye. And I vote aye. Resolution number 451 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 452, Boston Spa Public Library proposition. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Resolution number 452 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 453, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 453 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 454, agreement, professional services. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 454 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 455, award of bid, safety, and security film. So Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Resolution number 455 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 456, placement of students with disabilities. So Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Resolution number 456 passes. I have a motion to approve resolution number 457, placement of preschool students with disabilities. Second. Is there any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstentions? Resolution number 457 passes. Resolutions number 458 through 465 are recognized as a consent agenda for the purpose of Board of Education action. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Resolutions number 458 through 465. Second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Resolution number 458 through 465 passes. Are there any appointments to recognize? Anyone in attendance? Okay. Any other new business? I just have one thing. I handed out a flyer everyone should have. There's an event that the Wish We Boses is hosting, a Women in Trades event, uh, Wednesday, March 27th. And um, we will have uh, some members of our administration attending. I will be attending. And um, I just, for your consideration, uh, any other board members who want to attend, you can register online or use that fancy QR code that's here um, for a, a quick five field registration for it just so they have an idea about how many people go but um, you know it, it's really a great event uh, the BOCES women in trades program is something that uh, is incredibly valuable to the 31 component school districts in the BOCES our own district has its own um, technical education programs and I think that potentially um, there could be some synergies and some uh, integration and some things to learn from how the BOCES is also approaching that and what the community partners have to share in terms of the community partner efforts 
um, to do that. So if anyone is available, I just leave that for your consideration. Okay. Uh, we are now at the second time in our agenda for public comment. Do we have anyone signed up? We do not. Um, our associations, Ms. McGowan is left. Uh, any other uh, PTAs? No? No, but in Tim's absence, I just wanted to um, thank all of the PTAs for organizing a joint transportation appreciation luncheon for um, next Tuesday. Uh, we have all realized how vital that team is to our entire community. So thank you to the PTAs for the hard work in organizing that. Thank you, absolutely. All right, uh, we are time for adjournment. We do have reason to go into executive session. Oh, I'm sorry, Law. Just a couple quick things. Yeah. Um, one, the BACC is an open gym this Friday. Just make the community aware it's from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, free for all ages, no cost. Um, about 12 and under does require you know, adult super supervision. So come out and have some fun there. And uh, just something, if, you know, if you're a parent of a certain age, older student, maybe just graduated, you remember the box tops for education where you would cut them out and some loyal PTA um, volunteer would paste it onto a sheet of paper and mail it in and the school district would get some free money. So they've actually, they've gone digital. I'm, um, I'm sure people are aware of this, but just to, as a refresher to make people aware of it, it's an app, um, very easy. You come home from the grocery store with your receipt even if it's one of those big long receipts, you just take a couple pictures and it finds the things for you, automatically applies. So uh, middle school has got $58.40 for the school year um, out of a thousand. So, um, and this is, any, anyone can do this, you know, sign up for the, any of your Balsam Spa uh, schools, uh, the elementary or the middle. And uh, just within two weeks of coming home from the grocery store, snap a picture of your receipt um, grandparents can do this, everyone can do this, and it's free money, so it's always just trying to remember when you get home to do it, so do it in the car. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I need a motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss the employment of a particular person and to discuss a particular student matter protected by federal law. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned.